to believe. Let's bow our heads one more time and thank God for this time together. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the privilege that we have to call you Savior, Lord, and friend. Thank you that we are able to enter in this new year with life and fresh opportunities to embrace you anew in our lives. Father, you and you alone hold our future. We have seen you guide us in the past. And because we know you hold the future, we call on you to guide us now. We call on your Holy Spirit to bring us into communion with you and harmony with your ways and with your mission. Father, we come asking for forgiveness for our falling short. We come asking for grace, for mercy. Something we only ask for when we acknowledge that we need it. So bless the words that are spoken here today, Father. May it come from your throne. May it come from your heart. Take hold of this weak vessel and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What do Seventh-day Adventists believe? It's a question that's been asked by many over many different conversations from the average person and job to those who focus on their studies in theology, missions, pastoral ministry. Who exactly are Seventh-day Adventists? I don't know. Has anyone ever asked you that question? Well, what do Seventh-day Adventists believe? Perhaps they've come up to you and said, Wait, I think I know who you guys are. Y'all don't eat pork, right? Or maybe they've come up to you and said, well, who, who are you guys? Wait, 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 wait. You go to church on Saturday, don't you? Or if in certain unique situations, it used to be more common in the past, they might go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're that group that doesn't believe Jesus is God, right? <laughs> Wrong group. Oh, you guys are that group that go door to door in twos, right? We used to. Probably should. Eventually much more again. <clears throat> when COVID is a little cleaner to do. I would say yes, we do. But don't confuse us. I'm not a Mormon. And I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. And it doesn't matter if they came up around the same time frame. We're not each other. But yet sometimes we've had those conversations where we've had to clarify, right? I mean, it doesn't probably help all the time that Mormons are uh, Latter-day Saints. And so their acronym is LDS and we are SDA. <laughs> So we've had to explain that to people. In fact, I have to tell you, in, in my circles of apologetics, which I is my passion and been my area of study, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment, I have, over the years, listened to modern-day pastors and theologians who are addressing to their congregations who are Seventh-day Adventists. And I've got to tell you, there's a little bit of confusion out there. In fact, I have actually heard them state it. Well, if you want to know who an Adventist is, it depends on who you talk to. 
Because some of them believe this and some of them believe that and some of them believe another and then it's, they make it sound like we don't know what we believe. And if you don't think those conversations are happening, you should probably have more spiritual conversations with your friends. If you have any who aren't Adventist. That's a challenge. It's interesting to note that as I have discussed Adventism with different theologians and I have discussed Adventism with different pastors who are not of our denomination, I have began to realize that even within our church at times, there's a little bit of confusion as to what does it mean to be a All right, here we go, amen? So the question today is, what do Seventh-day Adventists believe? And as we are discovering that and understanding that we live in a generation again, as was being said earlier, that sometimes belong to a group system and yet don't necessarily wish to embrace everything that group believes. And I've often just said to myself, listen, I understand the importance of challenging our beliefs. That's actually part of the apologetics world. But at the same time, if you decide to choose not to believe something that is core to what it is to being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, or for that matter, a Baptist Christian, or a, a Catholic, or whatever case might be, then you better be up front from the very beginning with any conversations you're having with people. Does that make sense? You need to be up front, and you need to let people know, listen, this is actually what we believe, but I'm not. I don't do that. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying it's the honest thing to do. Does that make sense? Because to say, well, we're all Seventh-day Adventists, but we don't all believe the same thing. Oh, careful. Because that's sending a message of confusion to the world. And last time I checked, we don't claim to be Babylon. Babylon. You follow me? We are not Babylon. We are part of the remnant calling of God. And we're not alone in that either. And so I want to encourage you in this journey this year as we're going through the concept of what is it to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian that whether you're an Adventist or you're a non-Adventist, you're going to sit there today and go, you know what, I, I want to learn, I want to figure this out. What is there and, 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 and is it important? And I'm going to tell you why this is so important for our understanding. And we're going to open up the scriptures real quick in, in 1 Peter, our scripture reading for today. If you would open up your scriptures to 1 Peter. <clears throat> we were there all last week. 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's bow our heads and pray one more time before we read God's word. Father in heaven, this is your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for your grace. We ask for your understanding. In Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter chapter 3, First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says, But do what? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and sometimes be ready. Sometimes be ready. Always be ready. To give what? A defense to everyone who asks you a reason 
for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Now this is in the context of people speaking ill of those who choose to follow what is true and what is good. Those who choose to follow Christ. And, and what is being said by Peter in these words is that rather than being discouraged when people criticize you for who you are. Instead of being discouraged, set apart God in your heart. Now, I love this because the NIV, many other translations, put this in this way. But sanctify Christ as Lord. Sanctify Christ as Lord. Now, I love that variant in the text because to say Christ as Lord is to say sanctify the Messiah because that's what Christ means when you read the New Testament and you see the word Christ it means Messiah the anointed one sanctify the Messiah as Lord in your hearts now I gotta ask the question what does it mean for someone to be Lord of your life you see, it's easy to say he's my Lord, right? But what exactly does that mean? Sometimes we say he is my Lord because we come to church and say he is my Lord. Or in a moment we say, yeah, he's my Lord and Savior. But when you say someone is your Lord... What does that mean when you're saying the Messiah is Lord and you're establishing that in your heart? The idea of a Lord or the Lord is someone who is in charge. Someone who has control. Someone who calls the shots in your life. Are you following me? So to sanctify, to set apart, they go, well, when people start to criticize you, yeah, do Seventh-day Adventist Christians get criticized in the world today? The fact is, we do. And to a certain extent, at times, it harms our pride. It hurts us. It causes doubt. It causes us to reel back and maybe not be as uh, passionate about our witnessing and about our sharing of what we know to be true because, oh, we've been rejected or, or people have, have not accepted it or, 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 or they've treated us differently. But the Bible says when they start to treat you differently, make sure Jesus is you your Lord that he's in control it's not the time to cower away it's the time to say my Messiah the Messiah is the one who controls my heart he controls my life he is Lord and in this case Peter is elevating him even more because by calling him Lord we are acknowledging him as the kurios our God and creator of all set him apart in your heart don't cower away don't turn away don't lose that healthy uh, if we might say pride and when you say well is there such a thing as healthy pride well Paul tells you there is right because he says rather than boast in my accomplishments and boast in what I am and what I've done no I boast in Jesus the Messiah there is a healthy pride that that is okay to have first as a Christian and then as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. The world needs to see confident Christians, amen? And they need to see confident Seventh-day Adventists who are not afraid of what they believe and who can give. Look what it says. After you have set God as Lord in your life. The Messiah as Lord in your life. Always we emphasize that. Be ready to give a defense. I love this. This is the word where we get the concept of apolog apologists. Alright. 
or apologetics. The word defense comes from the Greek word apologia. Apologia. It means literally to give a formal defense or explanation or rationalization for why you do or believe or act in a certain way. In fact, that word apologia finds itself in various parts of the New Testament, especially when Paul is brought before the formal courts of Rome, etc., and he has to give a defense. He has to explain, you know, they used to accuse Paul of causing riots and, and causing problems and, and distorting the Jewish message and all these things. And so when he gets brought before the courts and they're asking him, hey, what are you doing? What is all this tumult in the town? Why is everybody upset? Imagine if Paul would go, mm. See, what happened was, well, you know, I was just talking with some folks. Well, what were you, what, what were you saying? What, 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 what is the deal? Uh, I don't really know how to put it. Ah, I don't, mm. Well, see, we all believe different things, don't we? That's not what Paul said, right? Paul would give a full explanation. And by the way, I just want to remind you, let me say, well, I'm afraid that I may not be able to explain it perfectly. God's not asking for you to explain things perfectly. He's asking you to explain them, period. The best way you can in your way. Because guess what? Peter didn't preach the exact same way that Paul did. You can tell by reading their letters, right? And yet if you read both of their letters, guess what you'll find? They were still saying the same thing, though they might say it a little differently. And what does that open the door for? Clarification, right? When you hear several things said by different people, hopefully it's amplifying the information. But we got to make sure we know what we believe. And I got to tell you, sometimes we tell ourselves, well, I know what Adventists believe. And, 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 and I ask myself the question, could you explain that rationally to somebody else? Could you give a defense and I love this, to everyone who asks you a reason. So always be ready for everyone. I love that, right? For who? Just some people, right? Just the people you deem worthy. Just certain people that know. What does it say? Be ready to give an explanation to everybody. I don't care who they are. Whether they're atheist, whether they're agnostic, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Buddhist, whether they're Taoist, whether they're uh, 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 Baptist or Pentecostal or Catholic or whatever, be ready to tell them. We have to develop. We have to develop that trait in us that can only come when we separate Christ as Lord in our life. Because when he is Lord, when he's in control, truly in control of your life, guess what he will do? He will give you the words you need to have in season. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Come here to the book of Matthew, if you would. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus had began to uh, not only train his disciples in the knowledge of God and the scriptures, but he was also seeking to equip them for mission. To send them out to, to spread the gospel to the world. That's what a true disciple does, by the way. A true disciple does not stay quiet. 
That's something you have to understand. They do not stay quiet. They seek to open doors in people's lives for them to know the message and accept the creator, the savior in their lives. But notice what he tells them in Matthew 10 verse 16 as he sends them out, as he gives them their apostolic commission. He tells them, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of what? Wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I just want to show you something. Jesus says be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Peter says to do so with what? Meekness and fear. See, same message, slightly different way of saying it. Meekness and fear. Why? Because it's not just about you knowing what you believe. It's about you knowing what you believe in a humble way. And when Christ is Lord of your life, you're going to live humbly and you're going to talk humbly with people. You're going to realize that, no, this is not about boosting Adventist pride so that we go, aha, look at me, we're better than everybody else. No, that's not the kind of pride we're looking for. We're looking for the pride that says, I was lost and he found me. And he can find you too and bring you into a complete relationship with him. Because I want you to understand that that's one of the things that makes Adventism special. You see, we're not just inviting people to have a relationship with Jesus. We're inviting people to have a complete relationship with Jesus. Complete. That means seeking to follow Everything he has taught us and commanded us and shown us. That is the aim of the Seventh-day Adventist church. So he tells them to be harmless as doves and wise as serpents. And I always ask myself the question, what would witnessing have been like over the years if we would have done it more in that humble, contrite spirit? Remembering where we came from too. Remembering what it took for us to have a conversion experience. And let me tell you, if you don't know what it took you to have a conversion experience, then I would challenge whether you've ever been converted. If you cannot identify your conversion experience, you say, oh yeah, but I was born and raised in the church. I repeat, if you cannot identify and share what brought you to choose Jesus and to follow him in this complete way as a Seventh-day Adventist, then I would challenge you to ask yourself, have I truly been living a converted life? Because a converted person knows when they were converted. And they know how. They know how. They know exactly how. I was born and raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But I can still share with you my conversion story. How I came to Jesus. And yes, it does include my upbringing. It does include my parents. But it's not just some factual statement. Well, I was born and raised in the church. Because that's, that, that's oftentimes what I hear in practice amongst us at Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Hey, when did you give your life to the Lord? Well, I've always been in the church. I remember I asked somebody the other day, I said, are your children uh, walking in the Lord? Well, they were raised in the church. That is not what I asked. I don't know where we get the mentality of continuing this thing that says, well, uh, that, that, no, that is not a testimony. That is not a conversion story. To say, oh, well, they were brought up in the church. Well, that's beautiful, but that, what, does, what does that mean? Are they walking with the Lord? Look, look, it's a clear answer. I can tell you people that I have in my own family. That I, wait, are, they were brought up in the church. Are they walking with the Lord? The answer is no. Not at the moment. There's hope, amen? But they're not at the moment. Just admit it. (laughs) 
We have to be humble in our approach. We have to understand what it was to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be converted, to be brought into communion with God in a way that totally changed the way you view life, the way you view others, the way you approach everything in your experience. It, it should be something that you're able to say, man, when, I, when Jesus found me, wow, it was, it, it was a change in my life. Now notice what verse 17 of Matthew 10 says, but beware of men, beware of men for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But verse 19, when they deliver you up, what does it say? Don't worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your what? Father who speaks in you. Guess what? The only way you can have the spirit of your father is if you have set apart the Messiah as Lord of your life. Because do you know where the Holy Spirit comes from? In fact, Jesus himself promised us the Holy Spirit. Amen? It comes from the Lord. It comes from the Messiah. In fact, in that same promise in the Gospel of John chapter 14, verse 25, look what Jesus says about the Comforter whom he, the Lord, the Messiah, our God, will send to us. In John chapter 14, 25, the Bible says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in whose name? In my name, in Jesus' name. He will teach you all things and bring to your what? Remembrance all things that I have said to you. Here I got to pause and remind us of something. You can't bring something to the remembrance if it wasn't there to begin with. Everybody following me? You can't bring up something to the remembrance unless it wasn't there to begin with. Look, I'm with you guys. I, I read the Bible all the time. I study it. It, it, is my, it is part of my life's journey. It was before I was a pastor, and it still is, even more so that I am a pastor. And, and I got to tell you, it's amazing to me how often I study the scriptures. I go over stories I've read before. I go over things that I've read before, and I go, man, I don't remember that. Man, that was powerful. And it ends up adding to my experience my knowledge with God and, and whatnot. But here's something that I find interesting. A lot of people always say to me, well, pastor, here's the deal. I, I've heard, I've taken seminars, I've learned all this stuff about what we believe, and, and yet I, I still don't know how to really do it. And, and I sit there and I go, well, first of all, you have to be wanting and available to do it. There's an old phrase that says, if you don't use it, what happens? You lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. I'm going to give you an example that, that comes to mind. My wife always laughs when I say this. But in my upbringing, I, I had the privilege of doing a lot and studying a lot of different things. Um, I had the privilege of shadowing a doctor who was my mentor for quite some time. And she hooked me up to shadow certain, uh, uh, well, one surgeon. I did that guy for a day. But she was a pain doctor, an anesthesiologist. I saw catheters being put in, pain catheters. I walked in and saw gallbladder surgery and, and held the gallbladder in my hand for a few seconds. It was really weird. Um, and I, I worked for this doctor and all of that. In fact, uh, I also studied in the nursing field as a CNA and, and got my training in that area as well. And I have all sorts of uh, knowledge that, that was given to me through various different things uh, in, in my studies. 
Well, the other day, my wife and I were cr cracking up a little bit because we were fixing the guest room bed. And um, my wife, has, who is a professionally a massage therapist, but she has also studied in the nursing field, uh, both formal nursing, CNA, all of, all of the above. Um, and so we were laughing because as we were setting up the uh, bed, I looked at her and I said, ah, CNA test, here we go, ready? She goes, what? I said, if someone is laying down in a bed, for a long time, right? When it's time to get them up to go for a walk or to go eat, do you get them up right away? She, and she looked at me for a second. Whenever I do stuff like that, she's like, silly man, silly man. I said, do you get them up right away? She's like, um, I don't know. She said, she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, do you, do you just get them to stand up? She's like, no, you make them sit down. I said, yeah. In what position? Feet on the bed? or feet off the bed. And she said, feet off the bed. Again, looking at me like a weirdo. And I said, ah, oh, good job. I said, why? Why should it be dangling off the bed for a second? She's like, well, in case they are, some of you know, dizzy. So they don't fall right away, right? So you help them there. So I was like, ah, oh, very good. I said, good job, babe. And then my wife turned around and then threw it at me. She's like, oh yeah? Well, now how do you stand them up? I said, up, oh, the test is over, I'm out. <laughs> no, I, I looked at her and I said, you know, honestly, I don't, it takes a minute. I said, well, it depends if you have the belt and you're helping lifting them up with the belt or if you have the other side and you're helping lifting them up. I said, well, yeah, I mean, it just really depends. So we were laughing and of course, my wife, I mean, this is, this is I may have studied it, but caretaking is her cup of tea. Is something that God has gifted her with in a way that I can't even explain because it's just what it is. But here's, here's what's interesting. As I was laughing with her about it and thinking about it, I thought, with all this information that I've gathered, you know, all the times that I've followed doctors and been with them and, and, and done rounds with them. You know, I used to get up at five in, four in the morning, go do rounds with my mentor, come back, pack my bags, and go to school. And so... When that time would come, I mean, I, <laughs> my English professor had me write a, I think it was like a 15-page research paper, and I wrote it on the immune system, and he was a PhD in literature. He finished reading it, and he goes, I don't even understand what half of this is. And I was like, well, I'm working on it too. <laughs> He's like, well, I need you to br bring it down a little bit. Now, here's the reality. I wrote that paper. I have books on immunology. But guess what? You're going to come to me for treatment? You want me to do gallbladder surgery on you? I wouldn't want me to do it either. Because guess what? I don't have a clue how to do gallbladder surgery. I don't remember everything about the immune system, though I studied it. I don't remember absolutely everything that I learned in nursing and every little nuance. I have knowledge that I do remember that's still there for health and wellness, but it's stuff that I have actually put into practice. You know why I don't remember the other stuff? Because guess what? I don't. I don't use it. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not a doctor. But here's the other side of the coin. Some of you might go, okay, well, that makes sense. Well, I go, well, here's the other side of the coin. You might go, well, what, well, I do know stuff, but, and I'm willing to use it, but it doesn't come out perfectly, and so then I don't want to use it. And I go, let me ask you a question. You think when a doctor begins his first residential year that he knows absolutely everything about the medical field? So should he not practice because he's just starting out? Well, guess what? The physician has to start somewhere too, right? And if he's a wise physician, or if she is a wise physician, if there's something they don't know, what will they do? They'll refer, right? They will seek counsel with the physician in their field or their specialty who has been there, done that for a longer period of time. But they might be the initial physician who sees you. So maybe we shouldn't have any physicians unless they automatically have 20 years of experience. Well, yeah, if like that works that way, right? You can think of any position, any field that you work in. I'm, I'm going to pick on my buddy Terrell. Terrell, how many newbies have you ever had in work? 
in your field of technology, in security and technology, all that good stuff? How many? You have many. You don't say how many. Has there been many? Yeah. Do they know everything when they come in? Do some of them think they know everything when they come in? Yeah. (laughs) Some of them do, right? Well, guess what? But guess what? Everybody has to start somewhere to build experience. So when you're comparing yourself, think about this. Why do we as Christians compare ourselves to people who've been Christians longer than us? In witnessing, pastoring, evangelism. Well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a this, right? So we compare. We, we go, oh, yeah, I, I, I can't do it the way he does it. Well, you think he always did it this way? I, I surely haven't. I've seen my preaching, my giving Bible studies, my teaching. It has changed over the years. And hopefully for the better by God's grace. But guess what? It evolves because that's who we are. You have to be willing to start somewhere. As we're coming down here to the close, I, I want you to see a couple more things and then we're done. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 16. Paul tells this to young Timothy. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them for in doing this you will save both yourselves and those who hear you. I want to share something with you from... Uh, the Desire of Ages, really awesome book, uh, chapter 37, page 355. Notice what he tells Timothy, take heed to doctrine. Doctrine means teaching, all right? Doctrine means teaching. And uh, take heed to teaching. Take heed to what you are being taught is in the scriptures. Pay attention, study it for yourself, and believe and use it. Now, I want you to notice something that Mrs. White actually mentioned in Matthew chapter 10. Look what it says. The servants of Christ were to prepare no set speech to present when brought to their to trial. Their preparation was to be made day by day in treasuring up the precious truths of God's word and through prayer strengthening their faith. When they were brought into trial, the Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance the very truths that would be needed. A daily earnest striving to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent would bring power and efficiency to the soul. The knowledge obtained by diligent searching of the scriptures would be flashed into the memory at the right time. But watch this. But if any had neglected to acquaint themselves with the word of Christ, If they had never tested the power of his grace in trial, they could not expect that the Holy Spirit would bring his words to their remembrance. They were to serve God daily with undivided affection and then trust him. We can sit there and say, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Maybe you could sit there and say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, but I'm curious to know what you guys believe. But the question is, how diligently are you seeking God in your life right now? How diligently are you reading this book which is at the foundation of Christianity getting to know who Christ is what he did how he act how he talked what his desires are for you and me how often are we doing it because uh, here's another thing outside of if you don't use it you lose it if if we are not spending time with God now, how do we expect him to bring to remembrance what we never placed in our hearts? It can't happen. It can't happen. So here's how I'm going to close as we get started with this year. One of our tools that we're going to use as our main reference tool throughout the whole year is this nice book right here. Seventh-day Adventists Believe. Originally, it was published, the first summation of our belief system like this, was published in 1980. 
1980, the Seventh-day Adventist church came together, realizing that we were living in a world that wanted to understand who are Seventh-day Adventists. Now, in the 1800s and 1900s, uh, several times, we published brief summations of what we believed. But we never really explained in detail what we believed. And you know why we didn't do that? Because we are a church that is anti-credal. I want you to understand that. We are anti-credal. What do we mean by that? I don't mean that we may not believe in certain creeds that Christendom have created in history, certain aspects of those creeds. But we are anti the idea that a human-made creed, a statement of beliefs, is what actually tests the faith of an individual. We believe that the only creed that the Christian should have is the Bible. But you have to understand what I mean by anti, or if you want to say, creedal Christianity. Creedal Christianity comes from the reality that as the Christian church was growing and, and becoming highly uh, uh, embraced in the Roman world and politicized and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, obviously they had to battle various doctrinal differences that were starting to come their way. And so councils were convened by bishops and individuals in which to answer these uh, false doctrines in many cases, not always, but in many cases, they would come together, hash it out, and then they would vote on a statement that would then become the creed. It comes from the Latin credo, which means I believe. All right? Now, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. You understand? State a statement of belief. But the problem is that as Christianity grew, creeds began to become the basis by which they judge someone's Christianity. And so by the time of the Protestant Reformation, when you had someone like Martin Luther who was stating, show me in the Bible why I'm wrong. You go, well, why does that make sense? Because back then, when they would argue doctrine, they wouldn't always go straight to Scripture. They would go to, well, this father wrote this about this, and this creed states this, and this states that. And if you're not in line with that, you're not in line with us, get out. You're a heretic, and of course, in the Dark Ages, that could mean your death. You understand? And so over time, when the Adventist church formed, it formed out of heavy studying of the scriptures. Many of them were coming out of churches that were creedal churches, that were following strictly creeds, and weren't willing to challenge and put those creeds or statement of beliefs to the test of scripture. And some of them were ousted from their churches... Not because the minister could answer with scripture, but simply because the minister was upholding the tradition, the standard of that church or creed. So the Adventist church was very careful about creating a similar creed by which individuals could be controlled and judged in a way that ended up taking us outside of a clear, thus saith the Lord in his word. However, the need to explain what we believe has grown more and more important over the years. And because of that, this book was finally written. But I want to give you an idea of what it says in the very beginning of this book, explaining a little bit about it. Look what it says. Throughout the years, Seventh-day Adventists have been reluctant to formalize a creed in the usual sense of that term. However, from time to time, for practical purposes, we have found it necessary to summarize our beliefs in an organized structure. It begins to explain how that was done. And then in a, in a subsequent paragraph, it says, Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed 
and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. These beliefs as set forth here constitute the church's understanding and expression of the teaching of scripture. Revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of Bible truth or finds better language to express the teachings of God's holy word. You know what this is ultimately saying? Our fundamental beliefs, as explained in this book, are a tool. Are a tool, but they are not the foundation of our belief system. The scriptures is the foundation of our belief system. And whereas this is seeking to point us to how, in general, Adventists understand the scriptures... Notice that most of the time when I spend time helping somebody understand what Adventists believe, guess what I spend time in the most? This book or this book? I spend more time right here in this book because that is the basis. But this is a tool to help us better learn how to express and understand what we are saying Versus what we are not saying as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And it is a useful tool that I hope if you don't have one, you can order it at the ACBC. If there's enough of you that say to me, hey, pastor, we really want one. Maybe we as a church this year will order several of them so that you can uh, have one for yourself. And from time and time as we're going through different doctrines, we will reference this book to help you understand where we're at. Officially voted by the world church together. And so... As we are growing in that area, we can begin to understand, listen, these are the fundamentals that we understand the scriptures to be saying. And we embrace that and we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us as a church together to continue studying his word and to discover more and more ways that we can share that word with other people. I pray this year is a beautiful journey for you. I pray that as you grow in faith, I pray that as you grow in knowledge, I pray that as you grow in faithfulness to God, that your, that your journey will lead you not only to growing spiritually, but to help others grow as well. That is God's desire for you. That is God's desire for me. And by God's grace, we will see a new church, and a new spiritual life together. Amen? Amen. That being said, let me pray for you. Stand with me if you would. Let's have a word of prayer together and ask for God's blessings this day. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time in your word, growing in your word, seeking your face, seeking to prepare ourselves for the journey we're about to be on in our fundamental beliefs uh, this year. I pray, Father, that whether it's a Seventh-day Adventist or n someone who's not a part of the church yet, I pray that either way your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and our minds, would help us to listen, would help us to process, would help us to learn, and where we know something is truth, that you would help us to follow. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's sing our 